The student who would understand Freemasonry must not only study Masonic history, but must look carefully at the history of the period of at least 150 years, during which Masonry gradually changed from its original character into the worldwide organization which we have today. I think it is safe to say that it is useless to look for any dependable evidence of Masonic development outside England prior to the establishment of the Grand Lodge of England in 1717. Since that time, of course, Freemasonry has spread to the continent, continent of Europe and all over the world, but the basis of all Freemasonry as we know it is the peculiar outlook of the English people and its teachings and philosophy which reflects their way of thinking. For the proper consideration of our subject, it is desirable to briefly recapitulate the history of Freemasonry as far as it is known. The old craft guilds of masons, commonly called in their case lodges, because it was the practice of the masons to erect on the site where any major building operation was to be carried out, a shelter called a lodge, and these shelters served not only as places of work in the operative sense, but in them the masons met for purposes of discussion, particularly when they were assembled on an organisation to deal with some matter affecting the whole body. These organisations gradually changed their character during the 16th and 17th century. There were several influ influences at work which brought this about. A. The enthusiasm for ecclesiastical building was dying out. And B. The government of the day was opposed to craft guilds because the members being bound together by special ties which separated them from the rest of the community provided conditions in which opposition to government measures might be organised. Over a period of about 150 years, the Masons' Lodges gradually ceased to be organisations of men primarily concerned with operative masonry, and the membership of those that remained was made up almost entirely of the type of people who we now describe as speculative Masons. We must never overlook the fact that Freemasonry was not just built up by granting charters for new Lodges. Its real strength in its early years came from the old Lodges, which had been exist in existence for a long period as entirely independent organisations spread all over the country, and these joined up with the Grand Lodge after its formation. Development in Scotland and Ireland followed on the same lines. The old lodges, being independent organisations, had varying kinds of ceremonial. Probably the only thing they had entirely in common was the practice of rule by a master and two wardens, and the classifying of their members under the title as apprentices and fellows of the craft. This was a continuation of the type of organisation that had grown up in the operative days. Two powerful factors influencing the development of thought on the lines in which it is presented in Freemasonry were the introduction of Rosicrucianism into England in 1614 and the re-entry of the Jews, which began in about 1640. A fact very often completely overlooked by historians is that all Jews were evacuated from England about 1290 in the reign of Edward I, and the laws against them remained in force until quite recent times. During the period of Cromwell's rule, Jews began to drift back to England and no objection to their coming was raised. But the laws against them still stood on the statutes book, but they were not enforced. The reason for their coming was to escape persecution on the continent. A remarkable feature of the times was the bitterness 
which separated people of British stock because of what we would consider comparatively insignificant differences in, re in religious opinions. And yet the Jews were welcomed into, into society without any antagonism at all. We must rem remember also that the Jewish people who came in these times to our homeland were mostly cultured and highly educated. Consequently, their ideas and their outlook would have an influence upon the society in which they mixed in the land of their adoption. This section of society, as far as England is concerned, represented the manufacturer, the merchant, and the professional men. They were then, and are to this day, the mainstay of Freemasonry as far as its outlook and thinking are concerned. Although, of course, our order draws its membership from a much wider field. Many of the Jews were refugees from Portugal and Spain. In these countries, the Jews had been very strong during the two previous centuries, and according to Castells, Kabbalistic teaching and influence had greatly developed. I mention all this because it helps us to understand what will follow in regard to the development of the degree which will be the subject of my talk. It seems fairly certain that in the early development of speculative masonry there were only two degrees, namely apprentice and fellow craft, following along the lines of the old operative organisations in which there were two classifications. It is quite certain from early records that fellow crafts could hold senior office like that of warden and could be elected master. Consequently, it is clear that being a master in masonry was not in the early stages a degree, and I am of the opinion that any impartial thinker looking at the two first degrees, representing as they do birth and life, from the mental or spiritual angle, must see the closing in the second degree as the grand climax to the teaching of both. It is in fact acknowledged by all the dependable historians that the third degree as we know it is of relatively modern origin. This fact, however, does not in any way detract from the value of this sublime degree. Craft Freemasonry, together with the whole Masonic structure, which includes of course many orders, has attained its present form gradually, and in the course of its development, much of that which was of little value has been dropped, only that which fills a real need has been retained. The influence of Rosicrucian ideas upon the structure of the third degree is in my opinion unchallengeable. I do not suggest for a moment that the ceremony or the ideas expressed therein were taken from the Rosicrucian organizations, only that it was the men who had come under the influence of the Rosicrucians and who were also Freemasons who developed this degree. And to see the matter in its proper perspective, we must first study carefully the simple but profoundly important and practical ideas presented in the ceremonies of the first two degrees of craft masonry, and then compare them with the mystical and more developed ideas presented in the first and second tracing boards, which have a definite association with the third degree. An important factor to be kept in mind is the struggle which was in evidence in masonry throughout the 18th century. On the one hand, we find the moderns, i.e. the lodges owing the earliest allegiance to the Grand Lodge, formed in London in 1717, and the ancients, formed a little later, also in London, under Irish influence. As Dr. Castells has pointed out, the very use of the word ancient is sufficient to link these masons with Rosicrucian teachings, but there were two other particularly powerful factors at work upon the Masonic structure, namely, namely the York Masons, and at a later date, the ancient and accepted rite. The latter, though it appears to have originated in Scotland, had its full development on the continent and in America, coming back to Britain as a complete and very elaborate system of masonry. This finally brings me to the matter which is the real subject of my talk, namely the degree of the Holy Royal Arch, which, when the grand reconciliation between all the major organizations of the Masonic world in England took place in 1813, was accepted according to the Book of Constitutions as an essential part of pure and ancient Freemasonry, not as a fourth degree, but very definitely as the completion of the third degree. I think that any unbiased student of Freemasonry must agree that this was a happy compromise 
rather than a statement of fact. On the one hand, the moderns would have nothing to do with any system of masonry comprising more than three degrees. On the other, the ancients were so concerned for the retention of the royal arch that, without some compromise, union would not have been possible. Much controversy has raged amongst those interested in Masonic history as to the origin of the Holy Royal Arch, and many lovely theories have been produced. But as the historian Gould has pointed out, and he is no mean authority, the earliest unchallengeable evidence of its existence dates about 1740, and the fact of its association with the ancients, and also the origin of the Irish lodges where it was first worked, would indicate York and Irish influences. It is entirely Jewish in concept, but it is certainly not strictly true to Jewish history. The structure of its ceremonies and ideas is taken from the Bible. It purports to give the genuine secrets of a master mason, and this obviously comes from the same source as the ideas expressed as the climax of the third degree. The two degrees are definitely interwoven, Although many thinking Freemasons claim that the third degree is complete in itself, if properly understood. The important point is that in this degree of the Royal Arch, as indeed in all degrees of Freemasonry, the secrets are a small matter. It is the idea or the philosophy presented by the degree as a whole that really matters. The most elaborate ceremony, the most splendid dressing, and the most beautiful language are really valueless, unless, as a whole, they convey to the human mind something of profound importance, which is beyond mere spoken word to convey. And by this criterion, the Holy Royal Arch very definitely answers the challenge. There is no doubt that the early development of Freemasonry was an attempt to express grand moral ideas on the basis of a very broad conception of God, a concept as broad as that adopted by the Royal Society, which was founded about 50 years earlier than the first Grand Lodge. It is obvious, however, that it was very soon found that a broad moral concept would not satisfy all minds, and it was necessary to provide for many of the adherents of Freemasonry something as nearly approaching the spiritual expressions as is presented in religious worship, but without introducing anything that could become controversial. Remember, controversy had been the curse of religious life for the previous 200 years, and this we find in so many of the so-called higher degrees, very specially so in the Royal Arch. In craft masonry, the Bible is reverenced under the title of the volume of the sacred law, but the Bible is not read in Lodge. I think the reason for this is the fear of introducing controversy, as an indication of how careful the compilers of our rituals were to avoid anything that, be connect, that could be connected with religious opinions, there is that allusion in the lecture on the first tracing board to scripture. In scripture called Jacob's Ladder. Most interesting. You will notice that Jacob's Ladder is spoken of as in scripture and not in the volume of the sacred law, although the two are one and the same thing. As soon as we pass from the craft degree to other degrees of masonry, we find a different attitude. In almost all, some part of scripture is read, and it is obvious when one becomes familiar with the particular ceremony or ceremonies of the order concerned, that it is built around these passages of scripture which are read. This is particularly true of the Royal Arch, and it can be safely said that there is nothing to be found in the whole structure of universal Freemasonry so near to religious expression as the ceremonies of the Royal Arch. In the course of the ceremony, several passages of scripture are read, but one lays special emphasis on the idea of the search for wisdom, not as a means of understanding the material world, but the mystical world, the background of the universe, the temple of the deity whom we serve. A companion of the Royal Arch is admitted into a mystical body of elders and is constituted a prince and ruler. The mystical knowledge communicated to him is shown to be demonstrated in the several signs and the import of the great central secret of the degree. 
No sensible person will think for a moment that admission into a Masonic order will make him a prince or a ruler, in the sense in which those terms are used with our ordinary political and social ideas. Therefore, the implication must be that he has been introduced into a world of another kind, a world that has to do with his mind or soul, and not with material things. In the concluding charge, the candidate is told that the aim of the degree is to promote the glory of God, and that the eternal welfare of man is considered in every part of its ineffable mysteries. This last statement is extremely important, as it shows that the intention of the Holy Royal Arch is to convey to its members ideas quite beyond anything that can be expressed in mere words. On the jewel of the order are the words Nil Nisi Clavis Deist. Nothing but a key is wanting, is the usually accepted English equivalent of this Latin phrase. But it means, if properly understood, everything is here, all you need is the right key to obtain access thereto. You must not expect, however, to find in this degree something magical that will give you without any further mental effort the solution to all the problems of life. The great object of the degree is to point to the way of true wisdom. We can apply the words of St. Paul, now we see as through a glass darkly. That conveyed much more to the people of his time than perhaps it does to us, because, although glassmaking was known to the Romans, and glass was used to fill in window openings, it was impossible to see through it. The best that an observer could distinguish was an image or shadow of something on the other side. It is claimed that the degree is the climax of Freemasonry, and most impartial students will admit that the claim is justifiable, so long as we limit the idea of Freemasonry to that which has universal application to all who believe in the Supreme Being. And although for the Christian this is not enough, it is an extremely interesting fact that the great Christian orders of Masonry all have the craft degrees and the Holy Royal Arch as important parts for their foundations. I would like to conclude with the statement that, in my opinion, the Freemason who is not a Royal Arch Freemason lacks something of very great value insofar as a clear understanding of Freemasonry is concerned. <laughs>